Welcome everyone. Uh, we are going to be talking today about the transesophageal echo equipment, uh, infection control and safety. Um, this is part of the lectures for the Toronto General Hospital Fellows, uh, the Cardiac Anesthesia Fellowship, as part of the preparation for the National Board of ECHO um, from June the 19th, uh, 2019. So, you know, I don't have any disclosure to discuss with you guys, so we are going to go direct to the index. We are going to talk a little bit about the equipment, indications, contraindications, uh, how to manipulate uh, the probe, uh, how to maintain the probe. We are going to talk about infection control. We are going to talk about uh, uh, safety, probe insertion, complications, biological effects, and uh, the safety of uh, ultrasound. Okay, so equipment. So transesophageal echo has um, uh, several indications. Uh, the last uh, review from the American T Heart Association uh, guideline updated for the clinical applications of echocardiography uh, was published in circulation in 2003 and they state that as a class 1 indication for TE is the repair of a complex uh, repair of complex valve replacement, uh, history of hypertrophic uh, uh, obstructive cardiomyopathy, dissection uh, with aortic valve involvement. Uh, as a class 2A, which means uh, weight of evidence and opinion is in favor of the use and effectiveness, is any surgical procedure which has like a risk of myocardial ischemia, MI, or hemodynamic disturbances. And the big debate came up with the class 2B indication, which means use, usefulness and efficacy is less well established. So this is the situation that we are going to find in an off-pump um, orthocoronary bypass uh, for evaluation of uh, regional myocardial function. Same thing is going to happen with evaluation of coronary anatomy or graft patency. So those two indications uh, are related to standard uh, on-pump uh, ACVs or even like a long transplantation is a class 2B for checking of the graft patency or the anastomosis on the pulmonary veins. Um, and then it's when the risk and benefits needs to actually be pondered and make a, a formal decision if you can or can't do TE. Okay. So in 2013, uh, from the American uh, Society of ECHO, uh, there was an update and basically what they described is that intraoperative uh, TE is uh, required always when it's an all open heart for valvular replacement, as we were mentioning, or valvular repair, or if you have a thoracic aortic um, surgical procedures, anything involving the ascending aorta, thoracoabdominal. Um, repairs and then they recommend in some coronary artery bypass craft surgeries what we normally do at our center is whenever there is an impairment in the systolic function uh, which is more than mild then we suggest and we recommend to actually go ahead and do it and then you can actually the the third statement is non-cardiac surgery but patients that have known or suspected cardiovascular pathology which may impact outcomes um, it's important to, like in critical ill patients, uh, it's any patients where the transthoracic images are not able to be obtained. So contraindications. So the first report that we got is uh, from 1999 from the American Society of ECHO and the SCA uh, guidelines, which uh, it states that the absolute contraindications is a is no esophagus, a previous esophagectomy or esophagogastrectomy, an esophageal structure, an esophageal tumor or diverticulum, or uh, an esophageal trauma whenever you have a perforation or a laceration. Otherwise, it's a relative contraindication. Okay, so the fact of having a recent esophageal gastric surgery is again a relative contraindication. The same thing that an tracheoesophageal fistula. Okay, so that's from 1999. So in May 2010, there was like a practice uh, guidelines from the SCA that were updated uh, in conjunction with the uh, American uh, Society of Anesthesia, which uh, states that the TE may be used for patients with oral, esophageal, or gastric disease if the expected benefit outweighs the potential risk, provided appropriate precautions are applied. 
So at the end it's, it's a balance and you guys need to decide. Um, the last update from the American Society of Echo from 2013, it keeps saying exactly the same statement. Absolute is going to be a perforated uh, viscous and esophageal structure tumor diverticulum or an esophageal perforation or laceration, but they include a new thing, which is the, as you can see here, the active upper GI bleed. So before it wasn't included, and then since 2013, an active upper GA bleed is an absolute contraindication. And then on the right hand side, you can actually see um, the relative uh, contraindications. And one of the things that we were always discussing when we are actually doing TE is uh, if the patients with uh, yatal hernia are uh, an absolute contraindication for transesophageal echo, and they only mention it here as a relative contraindication. Okay, so now we have talked about the the, the, the contraindications and indications of TE, we are going to follow up uh, with the uh, instrument controls. Okay, so basically what we want with those controls is to adjust the image based on the anatomic structures that are displayed. So you need to optimize your image for the structures that, that you are assessing. Okay, so each structure is examined in multiple imaging planes and from there uh, with more than one transducer position. So basically, the possibilities that we have in transesophageal echo, and that's what well described in, a, in the comprehensive uh, TE examination from the American Society of Echo guidelines in 2013, you can advance, withdraw your probe, turn left, turn right, and the flex, right of flex, flex to the right, and flex to the left. And on top of that, you can rotate your omniplane from zero degrees to 180 degrees, okay? So the way of actually mentioning all that is we call superior when you go towards the head, inferior when you go towards the feet, so superior and inferior, and then you call, you advance and you withdraw. Anterior and posterior, you can actually achieve it with anteflexion and retroflexion, which is anterior towards the sternum, posterior retroflexion towards the spine. You have the advancing that we're drawing that we previously mentioned, and then you can rotate towards the right clockwise, towards the left counterclockwise, and you can rotate the omniplane from 0 to 180 degrees. Okay, so when we rotate our angle, so when we start at 0 degrees, you basically are cutting the heart in half, showing the four chamber view where you have on the right side of the screen your left ventricle and on the left side of the screen your right ventricle, okay? So when you go to 90 degrees, if you are focusing on the LV, what you're going to have on the right side of the screen is going to be your anterior part and on the left side your inferior. And again, if you increment it to 180, what you are actually obtaining is a flip image from your four chamber, okay? You are very familiar with the angle manipulation. We are not going to comment anything else on that. Okay, so instrument manipulation. So those are the classical probe. This specifically is an X7 uh, Philips probe. Same thing for the G machine. Uh, basically, same thing for the Siemens. Okay, so you have two knobs. The first knob, uh, uh, like the 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 small the small um, handle, is the one that is uh, the the one on top is the smaller and is the one that is going to give you the right to left axis movement of the probe. The second handle or the biggest handle which is underneath uh, the small one is the one that is going to allow you to do anteflexion or retroflexion and then you have the possibility of lock or unlock the movements of the probe. The G machine has, uh, has an extra knob. Here we have a lateral two knobs for increasing and decreasing your angle and the, the G has an extra knob in the middle that can actually make you jump from 0 to 90 degrees in, in your angle. So probe maintenance. Um, it's recommended to use protective covers as we use for the electrical connector and for the tip of the probe. Uh, we need to check before we put the probe in for brakes, fissures or extruding wires because there is a risk of uh, electrical safety, okay? We need to avoid exaggerated flexion or uh, of, of the tip of the probe because we can actually do damage to the esophagus or to the stomach and then we will show you some examples of that afterwards. 
uh, you need to use infection control after the use and we will go through all the phases and you need to do an electrical safety if you see any fissure or any breaks or extruding wires okay um, it's recommended to keep a maintenance logbook for each uh, PE probe so what are the most common things that we can find when there is like a, a rupture of the of the equipment no so those are examples uh, so as you can see here there are some breaks there are some fissures there are some uh, not streaming wires but cracks and all this needs to be checked before introducing the probe into the patient so what can happen if we exaggerate the we we exaggerate the flexion uh, the the tip of the probe so this is the most usual thing that we can see and those are safety issues because with time uh, this uh, this cover will actually get damaged and erosion and then you can actually have an, an electrical issue here okay so we are going to talk about infection control now so once the probe is used you need to sterilize the probe so how are we going to do that so we are going to talk a little bit about different options like uh, at TGH uh, what we do is like we drop our probe at the CPD dropping station once it's there what we use is hydroxyl peroxide 0.5% uh, uh, wipes and we use it for the for the elect for the electrical connection one wipe and a second wipe for the handle and the the and the tip and we leave it for three minutes to drive uh, to to dry uh, an alternative uh, uh, option to do like a mechanical cleaning of the probe as we did with the hydroxyl peroxide is to use 70 percent isopropyl alcohol like that's what they use at the montreal heart institute actually let's uh, from uh, one of the chapter published at the content the no uh, multimedia manual and they specifically clarify that you cannot use the alcohol for the connection between uh, the connection between the electrical connector and the handles and neither into the tip of the of the probe because then the, the isopropyl alcohol can actually, at 70%, can actually damage those. So the only parts where we can actually use this kind of solutions is the, the, the connector housing and the control housing. But they don't, recommend the, the, they don't recommend it to use it in the other parts. So that's why at TGH we actually use, hydroxy, uh, we, we use uh, a different agent to do the mechanical cleaning. Okay? Once the mechanical cleaning is done, so we put the probe uh, in an we, we put the probe in an what we call an automated TE probe cleaning uh, machine. Okay, so what we are going to use for that is a 2.65% glutaraldehyde solution bath. So and the recommendation is uh, to put the probe there, do it during 20 minutes, and after the 20 minutes is done, is done, you need to to let it dry and recommended to put a plastic cap on the distal end and put it in the dropping cart ready to be used uh, again. One of the recommendations is to use the, the air tank to dry the electrical connector so you are very sure that there is no residual liquid so when you connect the probe you don't have a, a problem with the, with the probe and the same thing for the, for the knob handle. Uh, you need to dry it with the electrical, with the air tank so you are you are sure that there is no residual uh, glutaraldehyde after the the automated uh, cleaning okay so another option if you don't have a machine for an automated TE probe cleaning so it's what they use for example at the Montreal Heart Institute they choose to drop the 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 hose and the tip of the TE probe and they leave it at two percent glutaraldehyde solution bath okay for twenty to thirty minutes okay so what's the importance of doing those 20 minutes and can we cut it if we are in an emergency and we need the probe so the recommendation again is um, when you actually put the probe under glutaral latest position so the pathogen destruction is going to happen as follows like in the first minute all the bacteria are gone in two minutes you have a hundred percent sterile solution in two minutes you will kill uh, hiv and enteroviruses 
and you need up to five minutes to kill your H, uh, hepatitis B virus and you need a maximum of 10 minutes to, to get like a very lower tie of uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. So that's why it's so important to actually keep it for 20 minutes in so you are sure that you have a completely sterile probe, okay? So we have talked about uh, indications, contraindications and uh, infection control after the probe use but then we need to talk about the safety, no? So safety, how do we insert a probe? How should we use like a, a TE probe so we don't damage the patient? So the recommendations, and again, this is well, well, well described on the 2013 uh, uh, American Society of Echo guidelines for a comprehensive TE uh, study, which they recommend to insert the probe in the unlock position. So you need to be sure that the probe is in the unlock position. The bite block, is actually you pass it through the hose, but you don't put it in the mouth uh, only after the insertion. Why? Because if you put it in the mouth, you can uh, put the tongue on the back of the throat and then you can make damage to the tongue or make the probe to be more difficult to insert. So the recommendation is when the probe has actually passed and it's in the esophagus, then you actually put the bite block into the mouth to prevent biting from the patient, okay? Always advance the probe in a neutral position with a little, with a slight anteflexion of the probe when you are actually passing the hypopharynx. Okay, uh, prevent dislodgement of the endotracheal tube when the patient is intubated, obviously. And the recommendation is doing this maneuver, which consists in lifting anteriorly and caudally the, ma the mandible. In case that that's difficult, the laryngoscope can actually facilitate the insertion. And in many centers, what they recommend is at the same time that you do the laryngoscopy, you put the endotracheal tube, and immediately later, when you check that endotracheal tube is in good position, you just put the TE probe in, okay? So what are the risks of complications um, when we actually use TE? So the, the, the global, the average risk is 0.2%, which is extremely low and it's something that we need to consider. So what is uh, the most important part, and I think the major morbidity, it comes from esophageal perforation and we are talking for intraoperative TE of 0 up to 0.3%. Okay, you have a major morbidity and major bleeding, and we are talking for interoperative echo for a major mor morbidity is between uh, 0 to 1.2, and uh, mortality is actually 0% in, uh, in interoperative echo, which I think they are excellent safety numbers for, uh, for our studies. So what can happen? What can go wrong? No. So we talk about the complications, but that's that's what can go actually wrong. Like you, you can have like a buckling during the TE probe insertion, and there are many many ways of actually doing damage to the esophagus. Okay. So if that happens, you have trouble to pull up uh, the the TE probe, and you are not able to do what they recommend. Okay, is to advance the probe. Uh, with the retroflexion back to the straight position, okay? Don't try to come back when you are still retroflexing or anteflexing the probe, because then you can damage. So you advance it back, you advance it forward to the stomach in the straight position, and then you pull it back. And normally you have a higher success of actually removing the probe without causing any, any damage, okay? Perfect. So we are going to talk now uh, about the biological effects of the ultrasound uh, on the human body, okay? So the biological effects are divided into thermal, which is going to be dependent on your intensity of the ultrasound, and non-thermal, which have a mechanic or direct effect, which is called to radiation force and cavitation. So Radiation for cavitation and intensity are the three main things that are going to cause problems in the body. So we are going to start talking about the thermal bio effects. So with ultrasound, okay, uh, the increasing temperature is absorbed and converted into heat by the body. An excessive temperature increase creates toxic effects in mammalian systems. So that is going to be completely dependent into the duration of the exposure 
the type of tissue that is exposed, the cellular proliferation rate on the mucosa that is exposed, and the potential for regeneration in this area. Okay, so as per today, the probability of an adverse biological effect increases both with the duration and magnitude of the temperature rise, and we are going to explain that in a second. So the thermal bioeffect is the most important of all the bioeffects, much more than the non-thermal, okay? So there have never been any health-related problems associated with it, but I think it's important to understand how that works, okay? So TC is the duration of exposure in two minutes, and it's also considered the critical time. So to calculate the critical time, because the damage to the tissues only happen between 39 and 43 degrees, uh, the formula is 4, uh, 4 to the 43 minus T, which is the thermal elevation. To make an example of that, if your temp the temperature of the, of the probe is 39 degrees, we have 43 minus 39. So then that will give you like 4 elevated to the 4, 256 minutes before you are having a thermal bioeffect in the tissues. On the opposite side, if your probe is at 43 degrees, so that will give you only 4 to the 0, which is 1, will give you one single minute. So that's when your probe gets too warm and it goes to 43, you will see a message in the screen saying uh, the, the probe is going to go to automatic uh, auto-cooling and then it will actually increase the temperature by, by itself. And the recommendation is to actually stop to do the ultrasound until the probe actually uh, cools down. Okay, so the rate of increase in temperature, it came from that formula where the T is going to be the thermal elevation that we already discussed previously, where alpha is the absorption coefficient of the tissue for a given frequency, and I, again, is in the numerator, as in the intensity of the ultrasound exposure. And that's what is important from that formula. You don't need to remember the formula itself, but you need to know that the intensity of an ultrasound exposure is normally measured like in uh, millivolts per centimeters to the square or volts per centimeters to the square, and is going to be uh, placed in the screen of your TE machine when you're using pulse width Doppler, okay? The recommendation or continuous width Doppler. The recommendation is, as per the FDA, to limit the pulse width Doppler to 720 uh, millivolts per centimeters uh, to the square. The CV is the specific heat capacity of the tissue, okay? So the important part that you need to remember here is the intensity of the ultrasound exposure should be limited to 720, okay? And anything above 200 is what it can start to actually create like a, a thermal bio effect. So how do we measure that? So there is something called the thermal index or the thermal index or TI, okay? And this is the indicator of probability of uh, cavitation. Okay, so this thermal effect is going to condition a non-thermal effect, which is the cavitation, which we will talk in, in, in the future in the presentation, okay, uh, following up in the presentation. So it's the predictor of maximum temperature increase, okay, and it's the potential for the ultrasound heating related to an average intensity, okay, and it's going to be indicated during the Doppler, if you're just input with Doppler, color for Doppler, or continuous uh, uh, with Doppler. The normal value is less than 1.9, okay? So the formula is WP divided by WDEC. So WP is the relevant acoustic power at the depth of interest, and the WDEC is the estimated power necessary to rise the tissue equilibrium temperature one, one single degree, okay? So this thermal index is divided into soft tissue, bone, and cranial bone. So intensity. So I think it's, uh, it's important to actually talk a little bit more about the ultrasound intensity. As we were mentioning before, it can be measured in watts per centimeter to the square, watts per meters to the square, or uh, milliwatts per centimeters to the square, okay? The intensity can be measured in average 
or peak intensity. And there are three different kinds of intensity that, where the intensity is going to be different, which is the spatial, the temporal, and the post. So when we talk about spatial intensity, that means that the intensity in an ultrasound beam is going to be different in a certain part of the space or in a certain distance. The temporal and it can be measured as spatial intensity, it can be average or it can be peak. The temporal intensity is during the whole time and is during the pulse duration while we are transmitting and when we are receiving the ultrasound. And it can be average or it can be peak. And the pulse intensity is the one that is measured only during the transmitting time, which is the pulse time. Okay? And it can be average and peak. To understand those concepts better, we have the spatial considerations, okay? And that's what we're talking. When we talk about the spatial, spatial intensity, okay? So we have that the ultrasound beam have different intensities at different depth. As you can see here, you know, it start like a lot of intensity as, as soon as it goes deeper, it actually fades away. It depends on the type of, uh, of ultrasound beam, okay? The ultrasound beam have a different intensity at side to side locations too, okay? And a particular depth, the center of a sound beam is more intense than the edges. So those are the spatial considerations, but we are actually measure spatial intensity. And this can be average or peak. When we are talking about temporal intensity. Uh, what you need to remember is the temporal peak or TP intensity is the maximum intensity. Okay, and then if you see here, IM is the most intense half cycle in the pulse. Okay, uh, when you are measuring temporal average or TA intensity is measured both during the transmitting time and the receiving time. When for the tip, it's just at the maximum, okay? And the pulse intensity, the pulse temporal intensity is the average or PA intensity, which is only measured during the transmitting time, okay? So after those explanations, how do we mm, quantify intensity? Which one is bigger, which one is lower? So I think the most important part that you are that you need to understand here is that the peak intensity is always going to be above the average intensity and the spatial intensity okay is always going to be the spatial intensity is always going to be um, above your 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 temporal okay so what we have here is a spatial peak temporal peak both of them are peak they are going to be um uh, they are going to be always higher than your spatial uh, spatial average and your temporal average okay so the second thing that you need to know is your temporal intensity is always going to be above your pulse intensity okay because it's during the the both times as we were mentioning before so when we are doing that, the only important thing to remember is when you are using continuous with Doppler, your temporal average is going to equal your pulse average because during continuous with Doppler, you have a continuous with Doppler, as the word it says, it's not a pulse. It goes up and down, it goes up and down, and the continuous is constantly the same, which means that your sp uh, spatial peak intensity temporal average intensity is going to equal your spatial peak intensity so to your pulse average intensity, okay? So that's the only thing. So your temporal average is going to equal your peak average, okay? Um, the most relevant intensity with respect to the tissue heating, which the FDA is limited at 720 millivolts per centimeter to the square, something that they love to ask in the exam is the spatial peak temporal average. And why they are going to catch you here? Because the highest intensity is the spatial peak temporal peak. 
but the most relevant intensity is the spatial peak temporal average. Um, I like to put that in a to compare with a ventilatory issue. So which pressure is more important in a ventilator? Your peak airway pressures or your plateau airway pressures sustained during time. So that's exactly the same. So spatial peak temporal average is the highest exposure average over a period of exposure and it's the most relevant intensity and is limited by the FDA to 720 millivolts per centimeter to the square. Okay. Then I think it's important to mention too that the spatial peak pulse average is the average pulse intensity as an at an spatial location of maximum intensity. Okay, I think those are the most important things that uh, we need to remember. There is another concept that normally they can actually ask, it's infrequent, but sometimes there are some questions that have been asked about that. It's what's the duty factor, which is the relationship between intensities with time. It's unitless and it goes from zero to one. It's just the relationship of this the intensities with respect to time. That's the duty factor, okay? So remember, spatial peak, temporal peak is the highest intensities of all. A spatial average, temporal average is the smallest intensity of all. And a spatial peak, temporal average is the most relevant intensity with respect to tissue heating. So... Okay, we talk about um, thermal bioeffects. Now we are going to talk about the first one of the non-thermal bioeffects, which is called radiation force, which is a mechanical effect or a direct effect. So this is exerted by the sun beam on the tissues. The particles are pushed away from the transducer. And when the, par the particles are pushed away from the transducer, there is an acoustic extreme that is generated on the, on the fluids, okay? So this will produce stresses and extreme of the fluids, distorting the bio biological structures. That's what is called radiation force. It's non-thermal and it's a bioeffect. The second non-thermal bioeffect is cavitation. They love to ask about that, okay? So what is cavitation? Cavitation is an oscillation or vibration of uh, gas filled bodies when exposed to the ultrasound beam. So what happens is during the pulse wave of the ultrasound beam, so you have uh, you have rarefraction and compression of the of the bubbles. Also, they can refer to the bubbles as gaseous nuclei. Okay, so the micro bubbles resonate, and when they resonate, they resonate at a frequency. So this frequency is F0, which is calculated at 3260 divided by R0, which is the micro bubbles radius in micro in micromions. Okay. Um, the gas bubbles form with uh, the oscillating or vibration, and then they grow until they are, they reach a critical size and then they collapse. That's what cavitation is about. So how are we going to measure cavitation? Remember that we talk about uh, thermal index to measure thermal bioeffect. So mechanical index, because it's a non-thermal, is going to be the cavitation effect related to the peak pressure. And you will see that on your screen when you are doing 2D echo. We will see your thermal index when you are using continuous wave doppler, push wave doppler, or color flow doppler. But when you are just using your 2D images, what you're going to see is the mechanical index. The mechanical index is going to be calculated as the peak refraction pressure uh, divided by the square root of the frequency. Okay, which means the higher the frequency, okay, the lower is, your, is going to be your mechanical index, which makes sense because the higher the frequency, the less that the ultrasound is going to penetrate the tissue. The lower the frequency, the more that is going to penetrate. The same thing for the peak by refraction pressure. The higher the peak by refraction pressure, so the mechanical index is going to be higher. So the mechanical index increases with lower frequency sound and a stronger sound waves. Lower frequency sounds, so the lower the, the lower the frequency is in the denominator, the higher the mechanical index. The peak by refraction pressure is higher, which means stronger sound waves, 
so you can get more mechanical index, okay? The mechanical index reflects the amount of contrast harmonics that are produced. You have low mechanical index, higher mechanical index, and highest mechanical index. When it's below 0.1, uh, which is almost minimal, you have no harmonics, you have backscatter, you have a linear behavior of the bubbles, and normally is associated with higher frequency sounds, which it will be a surface probe, the one that we use for doing central lines, okay? When you have a higher mechanical index, it's up to one, you have some harmonic effects, you have some resonance, you start to have nonlinear behavior and it's related with lower frequency probes. We are talking about uh, uh, probes that are between five, five and three megahertz, okay? When you have the highest mechanical index, those are probes that ha normally have below three or two uh, megahertz, you create a mechanical index of more than one, you have the strongest harmonic, you start to have bubble disruption, and you have an extreme nonlinear behavior of the bubbles, and they are related to the lowest frequency probes, okay? So when we are talking about cavitation, we have two forms of cavitation. We have stable and we have transient cavitation. It's important to differentiate the nomenclature here. Because when you say transient, is inertial or normal. When they say normal cavitation, that doesn't mean stable. That means transient or inertial, okay? That's important because it's easy to get actually confused with that. When we talk about stable cavitation, Stable cavitation is at lower uh, mechanical index levels. So the bubbles expand and contract, but do not burst. The bubbles oscillate with the sun beam. They can be related to this stable cavitation, some mechanical damage, they can be membrane rupture and cell lysis at in vitro levels. Okay? When we talk about transient or normal, inertial, so it's when you have higher levels of mechanical index, which produces, as you can remember, is nonlinear behavior of the bubbles, rapid expansion and collapse, the bubbles start to burst, and they can lead to colossal temperatures and shock waves. It's not clinically significant. Okay? So cavitation. What can cavitation do? It has been described long hemorrhage in adults, and it has an a special important effect into fetus. So when we are doing the ultrasound for the fetus, so it's, it's a, something that doesn't apply to TE, but you need to remember that, okay? So just to remember a little bit, when do we have increased mechanical index or increased uh, thermal index? When you are using your Doppler modes or your color Doppler modes, more than when you are using 2D. When you have low frequency probe, when you have a reduced scan area, because you are putting all the ultrasound in a small focus, so you are concentrating more your energy there. When you use a deep focus, because then you need to reduce a lot your frequency to go to be able to penetrate the, the tissues. Okay, so when you go down, down, down to the screen with the focus, that is going to concentrate in that area your mechanical index and thermal index. When the power that you are using from the ultrasound is higher, and when the peak refraction pressure is high when the ultrasound beam, the power of the ultrasound beam is higher, okay? So we have talked about uh, biological effects, thermal and non-thermal. We are going to talk about uh, electrical safety, okay? So you need to remember that the electrical energy converts into thermal energy, but not sonic energy, okay? So what can happen with that is whenever we have like a, a rupture of the membrane of the transducer, so the electrical energy, instead of converting into sonic energy, is going to be converted into thermal energy. And this electrical harm or thermal injury with ultrasound can happen, but the risk of happening is very low. So that's why it's so important to look for erosion, perforation, of the sheath or any cracks, okay, before introducing the probe. As an example, when, the, when we are doing radio frequency for um, atrial fibrillation, there has been report of esophageal burns during the radio frequency and fistula or perforation. So that's why during those procedures, the TE should be removed during the ablation. 
I hope uh, you have enjoyed the lecture and um, we will see you uh, with the multi-choice questions uh, um, the next week. Thank you.